This is Nick Pope of the Ministry of Defence. He says he's the only person in Britain to have officially investigated alien abductions. He's also published a book on the subject. He believes that there could be an extraterrestrial dimension to this phenomenon. There are many different theories about what really lies behind the abduction accounts. At their most uh, simple level, clearly there is strong evidence that we are dealing with an extraterrestrial civilization coming to Earth and simply carrying out some sort of procedure on people. But there are other options too. Uh, some people talk about some sort of interdimensional element to this. Now at first I thought that this sounded like science fiction, but when you look at some of the bizarre notions being discussed quite seriously now uh, by physicists, particularly in the world of quantum mechanics, ideas of um, time travel and ideas of interdimensional beings perhaps don't seem as far-fetched as they might have done five or ten years ago. So is there any such thing as a typical alien abduction? Researchers say yes there is. Dr. Susan Blackmore, psychologist and paranormal researcher, has reservations about an alien hand at work here. But like Nick Pope, she acknowledges that the accounts have several recurring themes. If they see an alien, the alien tends to be about four foot high, big, dark, slanty, almond-shaped eyes, penetrating gaze. A lot of people uh, comment on the eyes and feel that they are the focus of the control that they are somehow being placed under. The account of somebody uh, seeing a blue-white beam of light and sometimes being struck by it is something that I've come across again and again. Usually the alien speaks to them without using any words. It's as though they're using telepathy or mind-to-mind -mind communication of some kind. Then very often they're whisked away or zoomed down a tunnel or whatever and find themselves in a spacecraft. Typically, an abductee will report a round white room with some sort of uh, table or raised platform in the centre. And have various operations done on them, as though the aliens are trying to find out things about them. One of the things that they then uh, were told by the entities was uh, a rather bland statement, don't worry, you have nothing to fear. Uh, this will not hurt you. Very often, of course, that was totally at odds with what was happening. The author, Whitley Strieber, has claimed strange and unexplained visitation since childhood. It was his bestseller, Communion, written in 1987 and later turned into a Hollywood movie that brought alien abductions to the forefront of the public's mind. It sort of ruins your life. I mean, I, I was on December the 26th, 1985. I was in a cabin in upstate New York, and I woke up aware of the fact that there was something terribly wrong. I saw these dreadful figures around me, little stocky figures that were dark blue, and a tall, willowy figure that had a big black eyes and a rather snout-like narrow face. I didn't think it was aliens. It never occurred to me at first. I kept trying to wake up again and I couldn't because it was, I was already awake apparently. I had, among other things, a needle st stuck into the side of my head. And it made a flash behind my eyes. And I can remember saying you're going to ruin a beautiful mind, and, uh, but they did it anyway. The next morning, I was in a state of uh, panic, like a person who's been in an auto accident or been the victim of a dreadful crime. Uh, I was uh, uh, terribly confused and upset, and by the end of the day, my injuries were hurting. I didn't realize when I was writing about it what would happen after the book was published. I never would have written about it. It did ruin my life. I, I'm like a, a, a sort of a pariah I, socially. No one, people are even embarrassed to go to dinner with me at night. There's something damned true here. 
that's got to be gotten out to the public because until it is gotten out, people are passive, they're helpless. They're sitting there just letting it happen to them and not knowing what it is. We can find out what it is. We do have the scientific tools to do it. We must cease to be passive about it and take an active interest in this. Although he has no formal qualifications, Bud Hopkins has spent the last 20 years researching this phenomenon. After having investigated several hundred abduction cases, there's one in particular that remains the most compelling and intriguing, and it happened not in a remote forest, but only a few blocks away from his own home in Manhattan. As far as I'm concerned, the most important abduction case that we have on record uh, involved Linda Cortila, and this happened in 1989, November 30th, in New York City. I don't expect people to believe it, and I'm not trying to convince anyone either. It's up to them, but I know what happened to me. In this particular case, a UFO above an apartment building in New York City turned on all of its lights. It had been apparently unseeable until that point. I felt a presence in the room, and I felt this numbness crawling up from my toes up to my legs. And when I opened my eyes, there was this creature, this thing, standing at the foot of my bed. It had large black eyes. It was sort of gray. And uh, it didn't belong there. There was nothing that I could do but throw a big decorative pillow at this uh, creature. And, um, and he fell back. I hit him. A bluish-white beam of light came out of the bottom of the craft, and at that point, uh, this woman, Linda Cortila, in a fetal position and three small alien figures, floated out of a 12-story window in full view of anyone around. Right out this window, here, I, I, I felt as though I was on an invisible elevator going up and into this crib. I would have screamed my head off, but I couldn't. Although there were no reports in the press or news media at the time of this alleged incident, Bud Hopkins claims that there were independent witnesses, both on the Brooklyn Bridge and on the nearby FDR expressway. The only thing I remembered after that was that I felt myself dropping into my bed. I knew that wasn't a dream. After these events, a rumor spread that the witnesses on the FDR expressway were in fact a high-ranking political figure and his two bodyguards. To protect his identity, Hopkins and Cortili refer to him as the third man. The third man, as I call him, uh, <clears throat> wrote me a letter uh, saying that he would like someday to be able to make public what he'd seen. He described in his letter the event of that night, watching uh, this woman float out a window with three aliens and how staggered he was. But for the moment, it seems, the third man is unwilling to come forward and tell the world what he saw. He finished his letter by saying... My position stands firm. I cannot and I shall not give a hint concerning my involvement. This is certainly an extraordinary case, but where are the multiple witnesses that the investigators cite? The bodyguards have allegedly revealed themselves to Bud Hopkins, but only in the form of a letter and an audio tape, neither of which was made available to us. We had arranged to speak to Linda Cortili's neighbour, another alleged witness, but when we arrived, we were told that she was unavailable. Until Bud Hopkins can produce witnesses, the sceptics will remain unconvinced. I wouldn't give the Linda Cortal case time of day. Uh, this, is all this is not science, this is hearsay. Anybody could say that they saw this or they saw that, and this is how these mythologies are created.
exploding geezer, a suit of armor, a mirage, an opera, a bomb, rolling dice, a tropical beach, semaphore. What is it that links these things together? Join us Sunday from 9 on Discovery and get the connections. Hear that? Das ist meine Liebeserklärung ans C25. It's coming straight out of the C25. And I gotta let you know. Weil es mich niemals im Stich lässt. It's my sound. Small, light, smart. The new Siemens C25. Get it? Be inspired. By me, a Mercedes Benz. My, My friends, friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my left hand. No help from my friends. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches, I must make amends. We're tired of my lifetime, no help from my friends. So Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? That's it. <laughs> a beauty treatment's more than just a face pack and some salad. Try Pearl Drops Tooth Polish. It doesn't just give you a smile bursting with bright white energy. You can feel the difference. And you can use it every day. Want to look fantastic? The secret's in your smile. Pearl Drops Tooth Polish. Beauty treatment for teeth. It'll be dry with a pleasant breeze, feeling fresh in certain areas. Arid Double X Nude. The outlook's extra, extra dry. Okay. Fine. This is Lucy, and this is that two-timing Casanova, Colin. He's the reason she's treating herself to a Sainsbury's ham and mushroom pizza, a soppy film, and an entire summer fruit sponge pudding, all of which are happily 95% fat-free. Sainsbury's new lower-fat, be-good-to-yourself range. Over 200 delicious ways to forget about Colin. Jane and Liz are identical, but tests show that if Liz replaced her ordinary toothpaste with McLean's whitening fluoride toothpaste, her teeth would be whiter than Jane's. McLean's whitening with TriClean. Gently lifts off stains. Used daily for four weeks, it helps restore your teeth's natural whiteness. McLean's whitening, a fluoride toothpaste you can use every day. Action. I don't have much time here, but if you have house plants, well, uh, the name says it all. Cut. That works, doesn't it? Now there's a special way to try Garnier Neutralia Body Wash. Moisture and cleansing, perfectly balanced. It's one of three different products, free with special packs of Kellogg's Special K. So you can feel good on the inside and feel great on the outside too. Look special, feel special, stay special. One of the most enduring abduction mysteries occurred in Arizona in November 1975. Seven loggers were heading home through the forest when they saw what they claim was a UFO hovering above a clearing. Their experience was turned into a movie, Fire in the Sky. One of the loggers, Travis Walton, got out of the truck to take a closer look at the craft guys in the truck were yelling at me to get back in there and get away from there. They were getting pretty alarmed and I was, you know, getting a lot more scared myself the closer I got. So the other, other guys saw a, a beam of energy of some kind. Nobody knows what it was. One guy described it as a long blue flame, for lack of better words. Uh, a beam of energy, a bolt of lightning. 
but it wasn't like lightning. It was like straight sided, like a, like a deliberate beam of energy, but it was so powerful it created like an explosion that lifted him off his feet and blew him backwards. Uh, I didn't see or feel anything. I just blacked out. And he hit the ground on his back, almost flat on his back, and uh, the dust rolled up around him, and it turned from, from apprehension, scared, into, into horror. And the guys in the back seat were yelling at me to get the hell out of there, and I hit the gas, and, and we were gone down the road. At first, I didn't know where I was. And I, and I saw these creatures standing over me. I started screaming. I just flipped out. I just instantly became hysterical. Well, we, we came back there very slowly, of course, so still apprehensive of something. And, uh, when we approached the clearing there, we didn't find anything. Uh, he wasn't there, the, the thing was gone. It was dark, it was black. And with a flashlight, uh, we were able to see some footprints where he had jumped out of the truck and run up to this thing, but there, there wasn't any tracks obvious uh, leading out of there anywhere. And a brief search we conducted there uh, for him on top of the ridge uh, didn't reveal anything. There weren't any tracks leading from there. Uh, Obviously, he wasn't there. He'd gone somewhere, but he didn't leave there on foot. I just pretty much concluded that whoever they were, what they, whatever they were, uh, they had taken him. Travis's disappearance and the talk of UFOs and aliens sparked a media circus in the small town of Snowflake. Having spent what he thought was several hours inside this craft, Travis reappeared on the outskirts of town, shivering in a phone box. He'd been missing for five days. In the glare of the media spotlight, Walton needed to prove that he was telling the truth. Well, I, I volunteered to take lie detector tests and uh, I took and passed three uh, polygraph tests. Some researchers have cast doubt on the validity of the tests that Travis and his colleagues took. It, it seems that no matter what uh, testing I undergo, and uh, no matter what, some people are just going to ignore it in favor of what they prefer to believe. But the story refuses to go away. What do you say to people who say these seven loggers in the woods just made this whole story out? <laughs> I mean, you know, seven people uh, are, are see the same thing. They stick by their stories for, for over two decades. You know, ever, all of us have taken polygraph tests. Every theory that's... More than one polygraph Yeah. The, every theory the skeptics come up with is just, you know, just absurd and, and easily proven so. What we really need to take forward research into this important matter is the involvement of mainstream science and the involvement of governments. It's only these two bodies that really, I think, can take us now forward and perhaps achieve some sort of breakthrough. Scientist Stanton Friedman, a long-time investigator into the existence of alien life, identifies the moment when abduction research gained greater credibility. It was a really big time for abduction research when two outstanding professors, Dr. John Mack from Harvard University Medical School, who's written the book Abducted, and Dr. Pritchard, a physicist, pretty high-level physicist from MIT, lots of publications and stuff, agreed to co-sponsor a conference at MIT. The invitations went out to specialized people. They published the proceedings. The whole point was to let the therapy community, if I can call it that, know that respectable people are involved. Dr. John Mack is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. He believes in the abduction phenomenon. He spent the last 10 years working with abductees to find an answer to this mystery. I'm inclined to think that they uh, are not from some specific planet, that they are, uh, they exist in some energetic 
dimension that is not familiar to us, or if it is, it's uh, only in theoretical physics. Does that mean it's not real? No, it means we've got to stretch our notions of what's real to include things that are much more subtle than what we're used to. But what about the abductees themselves? Are their stories just a quick route to fame and fortune? The, the idea that somehow these are people trying to get attention seems to die hard. Uh, yes, sure, there are uh, a couple of authors that have uh, had some success uh, along with the trauma of this experience, but the, the vast, vast majority of the people that have had these experiences gain nothing from it and uh, are not seeking any sort of publicity and in fact want to stay away from the media. It wasn't good enough for me and I just turned around and planted my feet down and ran right up to me. It says Psychologist Dr. Chris French, although more skeptical in his beliefs, does agree with John Mack on a crucial point regarding abductees. Now interestingly, the common reaction is to say that these people are just all barking mad. Well, the evidence suggests that no, they're not. They, in terms of the actual psychological profile, um, there are no obvious signs with most of them, I have to emphasize that, with most of them, that there is any kind of psychopathology. It starts to drop, and we were all like, oh my God, it's going to crash, and I remember jumping up. There's nothing from the standpoint of the kind of work they do, where they live, that distinguishes them. They're, they're, they seem to be quite a broad cross-section of, of, the, of the country. I have a uh, health care administrator, waitress, professor, theologian, just about any kind of person that uh, you can imagine. Harold, there was somebody with you. She was pushing up the stairs. Some people who claim to have had an abduction experience gather here at the home of Bud Hopkins, America's most famous abductions researcher. I know you don't have any kids, but I mean, if you These gatherings are called support groups, and Hopkins' assistant, Peter Robbins, explains how they work. The main function of the support group is to be in a group dynamic where the other people have a shared experience with you, which immediately allows people to let down their guard a bit discuss things more frankly than they might in a seemingly less safe situation and have an opportunity uh, for catharsis when necessary. That, hey, maybe alien beings have really actually removed me from my place of resonance and have, yeah. have done, yeah. you know, I don't know why. In these support groups, there's a very strong social pressure because initially the person might not be able to remember their own abduction experience and yet all the people around them can and to become a kind of full member of the group, again, there's a great social pressure to try and dig up that memory that by now you're convinced is really there. Um, and that's exactly what, at the end of the day, they're able to do. If you're upset, it's a perfectly safe situation to be upset in and that people do not judge you or think that you're strange because you've had experiences that the outside world might judge as unusual. I woke up paralyzed and I could move my eyes. There was a diffuse blue light in the room. I can see my clock radio over here. Although many abductees can consciously recall their experiences, some can only unlock their memories by a method known as hypnotic regression. Yvonne Smith is one researcher who applies the techniques of hypnotherapy to the abduction mystery. They have snatches and snippets of memory and it's that haunting question of what happened to me? I know something strange happened to me. Was it a dream? Am I just going crazy? What is it? They come to someone like me or Bud Hopkins or David Jacobs and we begin to start investigating the case. Using hypnosis seems to be the only method we have of getting at what exactly occurred. The arms by now should feel just like a rag doll. Loose, limp and lazy. Hypnosis, of course, is, has been the uh, whipping boy of the skeptics. Hypnosis can very, very easily be misused. If a very clever interrogator can lead somebody in normal conversation, which we know if you watch lawyers in action, under hypnosis it's even easier to do that. Dr. David Jacobs is a professor of history who has over the years developed an interest in abduction research, especially in the area of hypnotic regression. We've learned to ask 
purposely misleading questions and sometimes very subtly misleading questions just to see if the abductee can be led. And I'll say to a child, oh, when they took you in that room, that big brown room that you told me about, what did they give you to eat? Because they always give you something to eat. And of course, they never give you something to eat. But the child will, if the child says, oh, we had a pizza, uh, <laughs> you know that the story is not exactly a stable story. It's asking the right questions in the right way at the right time. That takes years of training, we found. Can you see that to make out any facial features? He's got the pointed chin. Can hypnosis be misused? Of course it can. That isn't the question. The question is, can it be used? Can it be used by people who have learned how to use it properly? Can you help people? That's what it's all about. Two abductees who felt that hypnosis may help them solve a 20-year-old mystery are Peter and Diane Shepherd. According to them, they were driving home from friends in Northamptonshire, England, when they experienced a period of missing time. Could this have been an alien abduction? There was a pronounced dip in the road. It is pronounced, it's about 12 foot, 12 to 15 foot deep. There was nothing up in the sky or in front of the car when we started going down the dip. But as the car leveled up, as it just rolled gently to the bottom of the dip, suddenly this light or object switched on in front of the car. I leaned forward on the dashboard of the car and I just said, oh my God. And that is the last thing that I actually remember. So I turned to look at her and she had her hands on the dashboard and her, her eyes were wide open, her mouth was wide open and she was completely motionless, just like a statue. I wanted to get out of there. But I couldn't do anything. And I said, please, please, this is in my mind. I'm thinking, please, please stop. I can't take anymore. Before I'd even got the thought out, before it would even formulated, it was over. And we we're about 200 yards up the road. And I hear Diane say, What's happened? Where have they gone? What's happened? The stillness had gone. And the, the, dawn. the dawn was already coming oh, yeah. up in the eastern sky. That was what made us aware that we had missing time. We'd we love to, to try and fill in the gap of our missing this, time. I would definitely want to fill in this gap. Just allow them to float. We enlisted the help of Robert Lamont, an experienced hypnotherapist who specializes in alien abduction and paranormal cases. He regressed Diane Shepherd two decades back to that lonely road. So you, you've now got out of the car on your own? Yes. So you've opened the door? Yes. And you're now standing outside of the vehicle? I walk forward, past the car. Can you describe this um, figure, this person? Well, they're very tall, like I said, and they've got an enormous head, like an Egyptian. In Diane's case, she saw a large Egyptian head. Um, do you think she really saw it? Um, as far as Diane is concerned, the large Egyptian head immediately struck a chord with me because um, fortunately or unfortunately in this particular case, I'm fully aware that she had a chap called Terry Waters do a lecture for her a year previously and she has got a copy of his book and his video and right on the front of it is exactly the same description as she gave me yesterday of the large Egyptian head with the wide nose and the mouth. My being suddenly became with his being the emotion was so overwhelming. It was the same feeling of when I was outside. Okay. Except that it was just one. Although something unusual may have happened that night as regards um, seeing something visually, um, I don't honestly think that um, with the amount of time that's gone between 78 and present day, I could ever conclusively sit here and say, yes, she had that experience without a shadow of a doubt. Aviation journalist and abduction skeptic Phil Class has little faith in hypnosis. I am told that the British Psychiatric Association has recently released a statement emphasizing that information obtained under hypnosis is very likely to be false and spurious. The thing that would convince me that alien abductions really do occur is some kind of 
solid physical evidence. We're often promised this by the UFO investigators. They often claim that they have such proof in their possession, and yet mysteriously it never seems to get from them to some kind of academically respectable institute that could do the proper analysis to establish that, yes, this really is something of extraterrestrial origin. <laughs> Daryl Sims used to work for the CIA. He now investigates alien abductions, and he claims to have physical evidence in the form of implants. He calls himself the alien hunter. The name came to me uh, from a, a lady who uh, interviewed me. Uh, she gave me this uh, name because she says, basically, you're here and your work seems to be centered around physical evidence and finding evidence of these beings, finding evidence that the events are actually occurring, finding out exactly what's happening, and actually hunting the being down and, and catching him. I said, lady, that's about as close as you can get. If, in fact, abductions are true, then there must be some physical evidence of that. Maybe all cases don't show that. Some will. There must be, if there's been implantation, there must be implants then let's get them surgically removed. We have. We've performed seven surgeries and we've retrieved a number of objects out of these people that are, that are remarkable. So there's all kinds of possibilities of, of evidence and, and uh, I have a number of scientists and others who are working with me to develop tests and techniques to be able to do this. Daryl agreed to show us his collection of implants, but only off camera. He didn't allow us to take them for independent laboratory analysis. The results of a detailed laboratory analysis of an implant has, however, been made available by scientist Dr. David Pritchard of MIT in the United States. In 1991, he co-hosted with Professor John Mack the first ever scientific discussion forum on this phenomenon. One such implant was brought to him by an alleged abductee. One of the interesting things that convinced me to take on the Price implant was that he had described the implant a procedure, and he'd said that he'd seen this uh, artifact with little wires be connected up to him, and he could view this process on a screen on the wall of the spacecraft. And I looked at it under a microscope. It had little appendages sticking out of it. So I thought, well, okay, uh, he's made this statement about what it should be like, and here it looks something like what he said. Pritchard then submitted the implant for further examination at the Massachusetts General Hospital. They identified a number of uh, dead white cells and cholesterol bodies, the typical kinds of things that you get if you have a little wound or maybe even an ingrown hair, and the fibers that were stuck in it were quite clearly cotton fibers. I had concluded that at MIT. So as far as I'm concerned, this artifact uh, is cotton fibers stuck in human damaged material uh, that accreted maybe over some period of time and ultimately was expelled by the body or by Price picking it out of him. What I can explain is why Price maintains still that this is an alien artifact. One of the most interesting investigations that I've ever been able to do was when a young man called James Basil turned up at my lab and said that he had an implant that the aliens had put into the roof of his mouth. And he showed me this thing, it was a small metallic looking object a few millimeters across. We were able to do an analysis of the chemical um, constituents of this object and we found that it was 50% mercury and the rest was silver and tin. And it's a dead giveaway, it was a filling. The more carefully that I look at any given uh, uh, ali alleged alien artifact, in general, the more certain I become that it, it has quite a prosaic origin. Undeterred by such evidence, Daryl Sims's hunt for the proof of alien life continues. My interest is to acquire physical evidence and what the world wants to do with it, what scientists want to do with it, how they want to massage that or play with it or debunk it or call it whatever they want. That's fine. That's their business. But that's not what I'm about. I won't quit until I cast that sucker. An exploding geezer. A suit of armor. A mirage. 
an opera, a bomb, rolling dice, a tropical beach, semaphore. What is it that links these things together? Join us Sunday from 9 on Discovery and get the connections. When relaxed, the body produces catecholamines, hormones that reduce stress. The pulse slows and blood pressure drops, leaving you with a sense of well-being. The feeling you get driving the new Rover 400 IL. Between you and a Rover 400, there's chemistry. When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, Something without want of love Bears heavy on my mind Then I look at you And I know it's gonna be A lovely day That's better That's deadly Or a life of meaning. Your money can make the difference. Please give all you can. This leaflet explains the new system of voting for the European Parliament elections on the 10th of June. Please read it because your vote can influence many aspects of European and British life from the environment to transport, industry and agriculture. Your vote helps determine who represents Britain in the European Parliament. So look out for the leaflet that will soon be delivered to every home. Hello, want a low-cost loan at your convenience? Whatever you want 800 to 15,000 pounds for, call Lombard Direct on 0800 to 15,000. Our rates reflect your circumstances, and our typical APR is just 11.9%. I've just got us a great deal on a loan. For an unsecured personal loan of 800 to 15,000 pounds, just call Lombard Direct now on 0800 to 15,000. All day in nappies can cause irritation and redness. Kiss it better with a Johnson's Baby Skin Care Wipe. Our wipes have a special Johnson's Baby Lotion that first cleans thoroughly and then leaves a protective layer to help protect your baby from irritation. Now, doesn't that feel better? Start experimenting with the new Rover 400 IL from £14,495. How can we live together in peace and harmony? Simple. Get a second line. That way you don't have to wait for someone to finish their call when you want to send a fax or use the internet. And right now you can get a second line for half the usual price. If you'd like a second line or a digital BT highway line, call us now on 0800 800 845. If alleged alien implants aren't alien at all, is it possible that these abductions have an earthly origin? The more I hear about abduction stories, particularly the ones that happen in bed at night when people are asleep, the more I can see the similarities between that and what's called sleep paralysis. Something like 20% of the population report experiencing this at least once in their lives, and lots of people experience it on a, on a regular basis. When you are dreaming, you have to be paralysed. But normally, that wears off long before you ever wake up, so you don't know anything about it. The muscles of the body, we know that they are paralysed when you're dreaming, presumably to prevent you from acting out the actual movements of the dream. But sometimes the mechanism goes wrong so that you wake up and you're still paralysed. And this paralysis is very often associated with buzzing and humming noises, feelings of floating or flying or being dragged away. Uh, creepy crawly skin sensations as though something's running up and down your skin and overwhelming 
all of that, a sense of presence, the feeling that there's somebody there in the room with you, even though you can't usually see anything. I think a lot of alien abduction accounts are in fact elaborations of sleep paralysis. The problem with that is, number one, uh, most of the people are not asleep when this is happening. Second of all, it uh, often doesn't occur at night at all. People can be driving along in their cars and uh, fully conscious and awake and this light will come down and the experience will follow from that. In a society saturated with UFO and alien images, is it surprising that millions of so-called abductees now see the same images in their dreams, taking the place of images which previous generations might have described quite differently? At this particular moment in time, people seem to interpret sleep-related type effects in terms of possible UFO abductions. Whereas in, if you look back in history, you'll find that in previous eras, they'd have been interpreted in different ways, perhaps as ghosts, or if we go further back, perhaps as demons. Um, that's not the way we interpret that. No, they interpret them now, and by and large, people don't believe in demons anymore. If you were to ask a hundred children to draw a picture of Santa Claus, their pictures would be similar. Does that prove that Santa Claus exists? No, it simply shows how pervasive the Santa Claus image is. Anyone who's looked at Whitley Strieber's book, just seen it in the bookstore, can draw a respectable alien. Uh, so the fact that everybody draws aliens that look somewhat like Whitley Strieber's doesn't prove a darn thing. You look at t-shirts these days and they have the image of an alien grey on the front. There's a danger clearly that people being familiar with that will incorporate it into an account and uh, whether deliberately or not will contaminate the experience they've had. But there is another theory behind the abduction phenomenon. And it's gaining popularity with some researchers. Electricity. Abduction researcher Albert Budden believes there's a link between electrical pollution in our environment and the abduction phenomenon. All these abductees or experiences are actually uh, suffering from, they've developed a condition called electrical hypersensitivity. And this means that they are hypersensitive to the invisible electromagnetic energies in the environment. Some authorities have investigated the possible effects of electromagnetic waves on human health, but so far the results have been inconclusive. Budden, having interviewed many abductees himself, is convinced that the effects on human beings are far-reaching. An electromagnetic field rippling through their house and through their skull, because the skull is entirely transparent to these fields, will stimulate the visual cortex and they will have something called um, a seizure. And um, they'll see a bright white light or a whole range of hallucinatory sensations that other people just wouldn't, wouldn't have if they didn't have this sensitivity. I think it's a very interesting idea. As yet, I'd say the research is, in, is very much at the early stage of development and it's, it's an area that I'd like to see more research into. Any explanation has to cover the data. You can't just chop away from the data and say, well, I don't like the ones where the object is seen by numerous witnesses all over the place, hovering over the house where the abduction took place and where the tree branches are snapped off. I don't want to deal with those cases. I just want to take an individual who has funny tingling and I will explain that as a neurological thing. He may be right, he may be able to explain that, but that doesn't do any good in terms of the abduction phenomenon. There's a perplexing mystery that, if true, may indicate the presence of aliens and possibly the military at work in this phenomenon. It allegedly happened in the winter of 1989 to a group of soldiers whilst out on manoeuvres on Salisbury Plain in England. The memory of this event was recovered largely under hypnosis by Robert Lamont, who believes it's his most significant case to date. The soldier who gave the account was unwilling to be interviewed on camera for this programme, for fear, he said, of reprisals. The only way to describe it was a, it was a flying triangle, and it was hovering above us, and it was totally 
totally silent. It was unbelievable. And almost immediately when we saw it, a beam of light came out of the craft. And it just stopped the other guys in their tracks, just stopped them dead. I saw them out the corner of my eye and it just missed me, the beam of light, it just missed me. I was lucky. As I was looking, there was a noise next to me. And a soldier came out of the bushes. He started swearing at me, he sounded American. He had this metal stick in his hand, and then he pushed me back into the light too. I was terrified. According to our source, the next thing any of the group remember is being further down the hill looking at the map on the ground, disorientated and confused. We contacted the witness at his place of work, a military facility well known for its secrecy. We established that he did indeed work there, but in what capacity we were unable to determine. The Ministry of Defence have no record of any flying craft seen that night. The case, as far as they're concerned, is closed. In fact, although the Ministry of Defence has frequently commented in the past on UFOs, they've only once made an official comment on the issue of alien abductions. You would let me have a statement detailing the policy and view of the Ministry of Defence in relation to the alien abduction phenomenon. Thank you for your letter dated 31st of August 1996, addressed to Miss Philpott. You have asked for the Ministry of Defence's policy and view in relation to alien abduction. Abduction is a criminal offence and as such is a matter for the civil police. The matter of abduction by alien life forms is a non-issue as far as the Ministry of Defence is concerned. I hope this explains our position. Yours sincerely, Dana Sauer. The idea is that the powerful conspirators, the, the governments of the world, the military, actually cover up all the really good evidence and therefore this explains why, the, why there isn't any. Now this basically makes a lot of the claims completely non-falsifiable. Leah Haley claims to have been abducted many times over the last 20 years by military personnel and alien beings. We asked her to undertake a polygraph test on camera to test the veracity of her claims. This man is Paul Miner. He's a former chief polygraph examiner at the FBI and he's carried out more than 6,000 polygraph tests in the past 30 years. Strapped into something, but there's nothing here that will hurt you. Are you now in Virginia? Yes. Do you absolutely believe your wife that she's had these experiences? Yes, I believe her absolutely. Uh, I see no possibility that she's lying or telling. Well, I know she isn't lying, but I mean, no possibility that she's even mistaken about this. I, I'm very convinced. Do you claim to have been abducted by alien beings? Yes. <laughs> Are you lying about being abducted by what appeared to be human military personnel? No. I tried to relax as much as I could, you know. It, it's, it's very difficult to relax, number one, when you're, you know, taking a test that you're not sure of, and, and even doubly difficult to relax when you know you're in front of a camera. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be very abnormal if I weren't stressed out. Are you afraid that you might fail the polygraph test? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can relax. You are free. I'm not free yet. We don't have any results. How long does it take to see you get a result? Paul, how long does it take to get us up? Well, we probably can do it right now if you want. I know that if the machine 
registers accurately, that it'll show that I'm telling the truth. Have you ever interviewed alleged alien abductees before? Yes, I have. And what were the results of those tests? All of them have uh, showed uh, themselves to be uh, not truthful. How accurate is this machine? About 2 to 3 percent error rate. The uh, test showed that uh, she was strongly deceptive to the relevant questions and the probability of deception being greater than 99 percent. And that is uh, shown by the uh, program that we have from Johns Hopkins University, which uh, scores the uh, actual polygraph charts. It showed a 99% uh, rate of deception. There's no doubt in your mind that she was trying to deceive us? There's no doubt in my mind. Throughout the making of this program, we've tried to come up with hard evidence to prove the existence of alien agencies at work in this phenomenon, whether through physical evidence such as implants or through the testimonies of witnesses to the same event. At each stage, we were unable to prove a conclusive link. Neither were we able to verify a link between the military and these alleged events. What is beyond doubt, however, is that something is going on. Some people do genuinely believe that they've been abducted. Sleep paralysis, media contamination, electromagnetic pollution and elaborate hoaxes may explain some of this mystery, but not all of it. What we are left with is a hard core of abductees trying to make sense of their experiences. And perhaps all of us, if faced with such confusion, would look outside ourselves for an answer, rather than into the darkest recesses of our own minds. There was no argument anywhere that this, all of this material constitutes an extraordinary phenomenon. I will have people look at me and, and uh, I, I can see it in their eyes, they, they don't believe me, but I don't really care. I know what I saw and I don't care what they think. If these guys really are visiting, why don't they just make themselves known? Uh, I, think, I think we could probably cope with it. Uh, I don't think there would actually be a mass panic. Um, that would convince me. The thing that most worries me about the whole abduction business is now that it's become so common and so many people think they've been abducted, I am sure that quite a lot of those people haven't been. With my work into UFOs, I was lucky because there was, as it were, more forensic evidence that you could uh, lay your hands on. You could look at photographs and videos, but better still, you could get hold of radar evidence, and indeed, you could take radiation readings from landing sites. With the abduction accounts, I'm afraid we are more dependent on simply the accounts of the people themselves and uh, at the moment it's difficult to see how we can take that much further. You get the feeling on some level very deep that there is something behind all of the fear and all of the horror that there's some kind of a wonder involved and, and you want to touch that again. From extraterrestrial creatures to the monsters of the natural world, what can the mysteries of our own planet tell us about outer space? Alien invasion continues now with a search for semi-mythical creatures. There are undoubtedly creatures that defy explanation. Official proof is somewhat lacking, but there are many witnesses who say they